10, 9, 8, 7, 6, start, 2, 1, boost to ignition, and lift off of Hello everyone, my name is Abra Jodhok and this is my presentation of rocket engineering and propulsion of my fundamentals of mechanical engineering course. In this video, I'm going to explain to you the science behind the engineering and the propulsion of this generation's new rockets. This is going to be a very easy explanation and without going much into details, I'll explain you the basic rocket science. This is targeted for anyone who doesn't have any idea, a beginner in rocket science, and I hope by the end of this presentation, you, you'll get enough knowledge to build a rocket in your own. The whole presentation is divided into three segments. The intros, where, where I will basically explain you the basic rocket science, the physics behind rockets and the rocket parts. In the second segment, you'll learn about different rocket systems, like guidance systems and payload systems. And in the last and third segment, I'll explain you the propulsion system, which is the basis of every rocket, explained very simply. So, let's begin. First of all, I'm going to start with a very simple question. What is a rocket? Many people have a false idea that a rocket is something that launches into space. But truly, a rocket is something that uses a rocket engine to propel. A rocket can be a missile, a car, a cargo using rocket engines. Here we can see a picture of a ballistic missile, which has almost the shape of a simple space rocket. You can see the warhead, the payload, which is cone-shaped, and underneath the missile, there are fins. We can also see the propellant tanks like liquid oxygen right there, and a fuel tank just like a simple space rocket. So it is really easy to understand that a missile is also a rocket. Here we can see some different structures of rockets from its invention by different countries. We can see the space shuttle by USA, the Soyuz rocket made by Russia, the Saturn V which was used in Apollo 11 mission to go to the moon by USA. This is a picture of NASA's own rockets which were used to send humans to space. We can see the famous Redstone MRLV, the Atlas LV-38, the Saturn V, which was used in Apollo 11 mission to send Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Michael Collins to Moon, the Space Shuttle program, the STS models, a very powerful rocket made by NASA, Atlas V, and the latest SpaceX Falcon 9, which launched the Bongabonsu satellite last year. Let's get into the rocket anatomy. The rocket has three parts, mainly the payload system at the top, then the guidance system at the second, and at the last we have the propulsion system, which is the most complicated one. This is also a very simple model of a rocket that looks like a missile, as there is a warhead, and if you look closely, there is a fuel tank and there is an oxidizer tank with, which are pumped by the two pumps and are mixed together into the combustion chamber. And then is passed into the throat and is exhausted through the nozzle. Let's begin with the payload system. A payload system of a rocket consists of different cargoes, satellites mainly the mission objectives of the rocket. Payloads can be satellites, cargo, cars, even missiles. Here you can see a picture of an Iranian missile delivering a payload of a bomb. This is the latest video of SpaceX Starlink mission where the payload system is deploying 60 Starlink satellites into orbit.
After the payload system, we have the guidance system, which is also a very important part of rocket. The guidance systems control the projectile, the orbit, the maneuvers like pitch, yaw, control, and the necessary systems to keep the propulsion system flowing. Here you can see a typical projectile of a rocket which has a mission to dock with the International Space Station ISS from SpaceX. But how does a rocket go to orbit? Many people have the false idea that rockets fly straight out of the Earth to get into space. But the actual theory is very simple and was a revolutionary idea given by Sir Isaac Newton. Suppose you are standing in a field and throwing a ball. Without much speed and force, the ball will eventually fall on the ground. But the second time you throw the ball, you give it a little greater force than the first time. And this time, the ball is going to go a bit more distance than the first time. What if, in the third attempt, you could give an amount of force and speed to the ball so that it never actually touches the earth, meaning it doesn't fall. If you can give sufficient force, the ball will not fall and will keep traveling in a straight line. And that is the concept rockets uses to stay in orbit. The rocket, after launched, rolls into a parallel direction with the earth with sufficient speed. Though the rocket is still falling, but by the time it reaches the ground, the earth also moves, so the rocket actually doesn't fall. Just like a ball with sufficient speed stays in a straight line. Here you can see an animation of the thought experiment done by Sir Isaac Newton, and it is the theory we still use to get into the orbit. This is a typical projectile of a rocket to get into orbital velocity, which is 17,500 miles per hour, to stay in 100 miles above the Earth. If you see the equation in the display, in the denominator, there is an h, there is the orbital height you want to stay in, and v is the orbital velocity you need, the minimum amount of velocity you need to stay in that height. Notice there is no mass in the whole equation. So it doesn't matter what kind of what mass you have, you just need the right amount of velocity to stay at a height, at a fixed height above the earth. And this is how a rocket rolls into a parallel direction with the earth. It doesn't leave straight out of the earth. In practice, this is the way a rocket actually gets into orbit and docks with the International Space Station. This is a very good animation of, a, of how a rocket goes into orbit. There is something called a Hohmann transfer which physicist uses to calculate the amount of speed needed for a rocket to get into a much higher orbit with a series of burns at a certain fixed time. A rocket can eventually get into the orbit of the ISS. All of these are done by the guidance systems, which is a computer and can be controlled both from the inside of the rocket and ground control on Earth. The roll movement of the rocket is controlled by the movement of nozzles called a gimbal's nozzle, which was a very interesting invention which rockets uses in their role program to get parallel with Earth. This is a video of a practical gimbal's nozzle. Here you can see the nozzle is moving. Such a great invention. As you can see in this image, there are different examples of controls. You can move the fins or move the nozzles or use an RCS control on a Vernier rocket to maneuver. Here you can see two more important points of rocket called a center of mass and a center of pressure. 
which needs to be in perfect position for the rocket to get launched into space. And it is beyond the scope of this video to explain those. These are the maneuvers a rocket performs to stay in the destined path. The first one is called pitch, the second one is called a roll, and there is another one called a yaw. Here you can see a video Roger of a roll program Atlantis. being completed by Houston a space now shuttle. Controlling the flight of Atlantis. The space shuttle spreads its wings one Atlantis. final time for the final start of a sentimental journey into history. Another video of a space shuttle completing roll program and doing its maneuvers. Houston now controlling the flight of Endeavour. The space shuttle begins its journey back into orbit. Endeavour rolling onto the proper rolling onto the proper. This is Mission Control Houston. You see the space shuttle is rolling. So now let's talk about the propulsion system and this is going to be our last segment of this presentation. It is a bit complicated but I'll explain to you very easily so that you can understand. Bear with me. So let's begin. The propulsion system in a rocket uses a very easy law given by Sir Isaac Newton. The third law. For every action there is an opposite direction. So if you eject something from a rocket you're gonna get an equal amount of force in the opposite direction. Let's say we have fuel ejected from the rocket. So by third law, the rocket will move forward. But if we can keep the flow of the fuel constant, then we'll get a constant forward motion. This is the concept of rocket uses. It ejects high temperature gas out of its nozzle by combusting fuel and oxidizer, and this propels rocket forward. The constant flow is achieved by pumps. This is how an oxidizer is combusted in the combustion chamber of a rocket. Oxidizer is something which releases oxygen by reacting with something. Most of the times in rockets, liquid oxygen in cryogenic state is reacted with fuel. For example, rocket grade propellant. This releases a lot of hot gas which pushes the rocket upwards. But we have to keep in mind that fluid always flows from high pressure to low pressure. So we need to have a higher pressure in the nozzle than the outside pressure. For that, converging and diverging nozzle called the CD nozzle is used to keep the outside pressure lower than the chamber pressure. And a high velocity is also maintained. Remember, this is an isentropic flow. There are two kinds of propellants, liquid and solid. Liquid is further divided into hypergolic, cryogenic, and petroleum. Solid is also divided into two categories, which we won't talk about in this video. In most of the rockets we see today, liquid oxygen is used as oxidizer in cryogenic state because oxygen is liquid at a very low temperature, and for fuel, we use rocket grade propellant RP1. Sometimes methane and hydrogen is also used. This is a picture of a rocket grade propellant, RP1, about 2 liters. Rockets uses two kinds of propulsion system, liquid propulsion and solid propulsion. Here you can see the image. Liquid propulsion system uses tanks to store the fuel and oxidizer. And in solid propulsion system, grains of fuels are used to react with the oxi oxidizer which is burned off in the combustion chamber. The main difference is, in liquid propulsion system, the rate of con combustion can be controlled and restarted by pumps. And in the solid propulsion system, once the combustion takes place, it cannot be stopped. This is a picture of a solid rocket engine. The fuel oxidizer mixture is burned in the combustion chamber and a thrust is gained. This is a picture of a space shuttle using two solid boosters and one external tank. External tank uses liquid hydrogen fuel and two solid boosters uses ammonium perchlorate composite propellant. In the first stage of propulsion, 
the two solid rocket boosters are burned off for a few minutes. And once they are emptied, they are thrown off, called jettisoned. In the second stage, external tank is used. Here you can see a picture of SpaceX Falcon 9 using RP-1 as a fuel and liquid oxygen as oxidizer. In the Delta IV, hydrogen is used as a fuel along with liquid oxygen. This is an animation of two solid boosters being jettisoned. You can see an animation of first stage of a rocket launch. You can see the two boosters being emptied. After the solid propulsion system, we are going to talk about the liquid propulsion system. Here you can see a simplified diagram. There is a fuel and oxidizer mixed in the combustion chamber and is being ejected through the nozzle. Liquid propulsion system are of two types pressure fit cycle and turbo fit system. In the pressure fit cycle, pressurized gases are used to push the fuel and oxidizer into the combustion chamber. In the turbo fit system, turbo pumps are used to get the fuel and oxidizer into the combustion chamber. You see there are two valves under two oxidizer and fuel pump. This valve works when the turbine works, but for the turbine to work, the pre-burner needs to work, but the pre-burner needs oxidizer and fuel to get burned in a pre-burner. So in order to get the pre-burner working, we need the valves to run. So you see it's a closed loop process, which I'm going to explain later. Although pressure fit cycle is cheap and easy to start, it has some disadvantages. For example, it does not provide enough pressure for efficient combustion and constant flow. On the other hand, turbo fit systems provide enough pressure and constant flow for efficient combustion. And they usually include pressurized gases like helium to push the propellants inside the tanks. That is why most rockets uses turbo fit system. Here you can see a simplified picture of both. You can see in the pump fit system, the oxidizer and the fuel tank are pumped by the turbine, which in turn gets rotated by the gas generator. But the gas generator needs oxidizer and fuel tank. So they need the pump to work. So you see, in order to run the pumps, we need the turbine to work. In order to work the turbine, we need the gas generator to work. In order to work the gas generator, we need the pumps to work. So you see, it's a closed loop process. One cannot run without another. And that is why pump fit systems are difficult to start. On the other hand, pressure fit systems are very easy. You just need high pressure gas to push the fuels and oxidizers out of the tank and open the valves. And that's it. You will get enough thrust in the combustion chamber. Here you can see a practical diagram of a pressure fit system. It is not as easy like before. It is a very complicated process. This is what an actual engine looks like. You can see the black exhaust coming out from the open cycle as because this is a gas generator cycle, which I'm going to explain later. We have now come to the last part of the propulsion system where I'm going to explain to you the propulsion cycles used by rocket engines. So let's begin. Mainly, there are two types of cycles, called an open cycle 
and a closed cycle. Different variants of these two cycles is used in rocket engines. We'll talk about the most used ones. Starting with the open cycle gas generator. The gas generator cycle works by pumping the fuel and oxidizer into the combust combustion chamber using a turbo pump. The turbo pump has a few main parts, a mini rocket engine called the pre-burner, a turbine connected to a shaft, and then a pump or two that push propellant into the combustion chamber. You see, the fuel and oxidizer are coming into the pumps. Then some of it, it some of these two are going to the pre-burner where they get burned, which in turn turns the turbine. When the turbine gets rotated, the pump also works. So as I said, like before, it's a closed loop cycle, you see. In order, to, in order for the pumps to work, the pre-burner has to work. So the pre-burner turns the turbine. So the turbine turns the pumps. So at the beginning, there are some process which initially starts the pre-burner process. In the open cycle system, the spent propellant from the pre-burner is simply dumped overboard and does not contribute any significant thrust. This makes it less efficient since the fuel and oxidizer used to spin the pumps is basically wasted. You see, the half-burned fuel and oxidizer coming out of the shaft in the turbine through the open pipe is getting wasted. It's not doing any work in the combustion chamber. So it's not efficient. This is why gas generator cycle is not used that much. It is a complicated design. It is expensive and it is very difficult to start. Like I said, the gas generator cycle also has a closed cycle variant. In this variant, the exhausted pre-burner mixture is fed into the combustion chamber. Although it is very efficient because the pre-burner unused fuel oxidizer mixture is now also burned off, it creates a new kind of problem. It creates black exhaust called soot which can damage the combustion chamber leading to burst. There is also a pressure problem. This is an example of the SpaceX Marlin 1D engine which uses gas generator cycle. You can see the black exhaust coming out of the engine. Four, three, two, three. Many of you know the Bongolombo yeah. satellite launched by SpaceX Falcon 9. It also used gas generator cycle Marlin engine. Let's come to the expander cycle. It uses a very clever design. The fuel, which is in cryogenic state, first is bumped into the walls of the converging diverging nozzle. This turns the liquid fuel into gaseous state and is used to turn the turbine, which also turns the, the fu both fuel and oxidizer pump. And later, the fuel, the gaseous fuel, is fed into the combustion chamber. Due to the gaseous state of both oxidizer and fuel, the combustion takes more efficiently. This is why expander cycle was used in many rockets because of its simple, efficient design. 
there is also little turbine damage. Here is a picture of rocket Dyne's RL-10 engine used in Saturn 1 rocket. A picture of Atlas V using the expander cycle. Finally, we have come to the closed cycle engines. The gas generator cycle, the closed variant I explained earlier. Now I'm going to explain the last three ones. Closed cycle oxidizer rich. The closed cycle oxidizer rich engine was created to get around the problem of incomplete combustion. The Soviets decided they would opt out for an oxidizer rich mixture instead where all the oxidizer but only some of the fuel was shot at the pre-burner. Here you can see that some of the fuel is getting into the pre-burner, most of the ox oxidizer is getting into the pre-burner. In, in the oxidizer rich flow cycle, most of the oxidizer is burned in the pre-burner and a small amount of fuel is used in the pre-burner. The unburned oxidizer is then combusted into the combustion chamber. This is a very good design ensuring complete combustion due to closed cycle. You can see the used oxid the half oxidizer that were not used is getting into the combustion chamber and it's getting mixed with most of the fuel. So it is a very good design. But it created a new problem. The oxidizer pump with high pressure nearly melt down the turbine. Turbo pump. There are gears. So whenever an oxidizer rich cycle is used, this gets burned due to the oxygen. Now we will come to the closed cycle fuel rich engine. When the Soviets created the oxidizer rich engine, the Americans stuck with the fuel rich mixture. But they swapped out carbon based kerosene for hydrogen instead. However, the engine had to be adapted for hydrogen, which is significantly less dense than RP1, the rocket grade propellant, or even liquid oxygen, requiring a larger pump to get the right amount to the combustion chamber. So that is why it has two shafts. Here you can see, if you look closely, there is a fuel pump, there is an oxidizer pump. Most of the Burn, the, the pre burner is using most of the fuel but using only some of the oxidizer. So that is, that is why it is called fuel rich cycle. You see the low amount of oxidizer and there is a fuel rich pipe. But there are some problems. It needs liquid hydrogen instead of RP1. So Americans were using liquid hydrogen. Here you can see NASA testing RS-25 fuel rich engine. It uses the fuel rich cycle. Now at the last comes the full flow staged combustion cycle. It got rid of the problems of fuel rich and oxidizer rich engine problems. With the full flow stage combustion cycle, you take two pre burners. You see the purple one and the orange one. One that runs in fuel rich and one that runs in oxygen, oxygen rich. The fuel rich pre burner powers the fuel pump and the oxygen rich pre burner powers the liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen. This means the full flow cycle needs to tackle the oxidizer rich problems, which again is solved by developing very strong metal alloys like the oxidizer rich cycle. You see small fuel supply for oxidizer pre-burner and small oxidizer supply for fuel pre-burner. So both the fuel and oxidizer have different shafts. If you look closely and study, you can understand. There are examples of full flow stage combustion cycle engines the RD270 and the SpaceX Raptor engine, which is going to be used in the future. This is an example.
So these are the four combustion cycles we talked about. First one was the open cycle gas generator. We saw the second one, closed cycle oxidizer, oxidizer rich engine. Third one was closed cycle fuel rich engine. And the last one, full flow stage combustion cycle. And with this, we're gonna end our presentation, the propulsion segment part. The videos used in this presentation are used for research purpose only. It should fall under the fair uses policy. I have linked down all the videos I have attached in this presentation. I'd like to give special thanks to my ma'am, the course instructor, Ms. Navila Rahman Nodi, for helping me choose and study this topic. Without her, I couldn't have completed this presentation. Thanks a lot, and I loved your course. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.